Welcome to this NPTEL course on robotics, basics and advanced concepts. In the last lecture, we had looked at how we had introduced parallel robots and we had discussed how to derive loop closure constraint equations in a parallel robot. In this lecture, we look at direct kinematics of parallel robots. So in the direct kinematics of parallel manipulators, the link dimensions and other geometrical parameters are known. Okay. The values of the n actuated joints are known. So remember in the parallel robot, as discussed in the last lecture, there will be some n actuated joints and m passive joints. So the first task in the direct kinematics of parallel robot is to obtain the m passive joint variables. Okay. So basically, how do I solve for the m passive joint variables given the n actuated joint variables? So what do we need to do? We need to first obtain minimal number of m loop closure constraint equations in m passive variables and n active joint variables. Okay, so m should be as small as possible so as to make our life simpler and easier. Then we use elimination theory for example, the Sylvester's dialectic method or the Bezout's method to eliminate m minus one passive joint variables to obtain a single equation in one of the joint uh, passive joint variables. Okay, and we would like to solve these m nonlinear equations in closed form for the passive joint variables. Once we find the single eliminant, we can solve that equation and then by back substitution find all the m passive joint variables. So once the actuated joint variables and the passive joint variables are now known, we obtain the position and orientation of a chosen output link from the known thetas and phis. Okay. So recall in a parallel robot, there is no natural end effector, not like in the serial robot where the free end is typically the end effector. Hence, we have to say which one is the out natural output link. Okay. Most of the time it is sort of obvious, but nevertheless, we have to say that this is the output link of the parallel robot. So there are no known general method as compared to direct kinematics of serial robots. Why? Because of this problem of choosing this M loop closure constraint equations and also to find the minimal polynomial in one single degree of one joint variable, one passive joint variable is not always very clear and obvious. So let's look at three examples okay, of direct kinematics. And as usual, we'll start with the simplest possible parallel robot, which is a planar four bar mechanism. So as discussed earlier, these are the three moving links, link one, link two, link three, and there is a fixed link. And we have this one fixed coordinate system OL, the first joint axis and the first coordinate system is at the same place. Then we have the second coordinate system on the second joint axis, the third coordinate system on the third joint axis. So these are shown as O1, O2, O3, and so on. Okay. Only the X axis for the coordinate system is shown. The Y axis will be normal to the X axis with the Z axis pointing out of the paper. So we have, it is very, by now we should be able to assign the coordinate system and the origins at each link. This is the reason why everybody works on this, because this is the simplest possible closed loop mechanism and has been studied extensively. There are ways to ensure that the results that you are developing or getting using some formal techniques like Sylvester's method and so on match with whatever is known in literature. It's a good example to illustrate all steps in kinematics of parallel robots, Okay, as we'll see later. The loop closure equations are very simple and all steps can be done by hand. Okay, we can do it on paper, by paper and pencil. So as I had shown earlier, the, the loop closure equation with the coupler link broken can be written in the following form. So if the 
point where the coupler link is broken is at a distance A from one end and B from the other end. So the X and Y components of that point can be written as L1 cos theta1 plus A cos theta1 plus phi2. And from the other direction, we can go L0 along the fixed link and L3 cos phi1 and B cos phi1 plus phi3. Okay, so we can write the X component. Likewise, we can write the Y components, which will have L1, L2, L3, A, B, and now sine theta and sine of the angles. And finally, we have the matching of the orientation of the coordinate system where we have broken the link as theta1 plus phi2 is phi1 plus phi3 plus pi. Okay, so, so from the above, we can easily see that this x minus L0 will be equal to L3 cosine phi1 minus B theta1 plus phi2. Where did I get this minus B theta1 plus phi2? Because phi1 plus phi3 plus pi is theta1 plus phi2. So we can substitute phi1 plus phi3. We will get theta1, phi2 and pi and then that will give you minus cos. Likewise, for y, we can write y is L3 sine phi1, okay, plus B sine phi1 plus phi3 can be again represented as theta1 plus phi2 minus pi, which will give you minus B sine theta1 plus phi2. Okay, so we can derive these two equations from this loop closure constraint equations. We denote delta with theta1 plus phi2. So we see that there is a term always up, uh, occurring, which is theta1 plus phi2. So let's call it delta. And we can square and add these two equations, and we'll get a1 cos delta plus b1 sine delta plus c1 equal to 0. Okay. So basically, what we have is uh, we have 1 delta. And if you see, if you square and add, you will see that this cos phi1 uh, angle will vanish. Okay, so we have L3 cos phi1 minus B cos delta and likewise and when you square and add one of these angles will vanish. And we will be left with one single equation in cos and sine delta where the A, B, C are x are related to x, L0, L1 and so on. Okay, and A and B. There is no angle in A, B and C. The first part of again the loop closure equation, which is this that x equals l1 cos theta 1 plus a cos theta 1 plus phi 2, and y is l1 sine theta 1 plus a sine theta 1 plus phi 2. Okay, we can take a look at these two equations and again square and add these two equations. We will get another equation in cos and sine delta. Okay, so it will be A2 cos delta plus B2 sine delta plus C2 equal to 0. And again, A2, B2, C2 are, are quantities where X, Y, L1, A, and so on other quantities appear. There are no angles again in A2, B2, and C2. So we have two equations in sine delta and cos delta. We can convert the, both these two equations to quadratics by tangent half angle substitution. Remember, I had shown you this in the inverse kinematics of serial robots. So we can say something like some x is tan delta by two, and hence you will get sine delta as two x by one plus x square and so on. And cos delta is one minus x square by one plus x square. So we can substitute all this back in these two equations and we will get two quadratic equations in tan delta by two. And we can use the Sylvester dialectic method, which is obtain the Sylvester's matrix. This, in this case, it will be four by four Sylvester's matrix. And determinant of SM equal to zero gives you the eliminant. Okay, so we have managed to now eliminate delta. Okay, and hence, we can, and we can also solve for delta, which is delta is given by minus 2 tan inverse, some a1c2 minus a2c1 divided by b1c2 minus b2c1 plus a1b2 minus a2b1. Okay, so this can be obtained. And the Sylvester's eliminant deter, determinant of SM equals to 0 gives you an expression in terms of a1, b1, 
C1 and A2, B2, C2, specifically of this form. Okay. And what does it contain? It contains all the link lengths. It also contains A and B where the link was broken and it also contains X and Y. There are no known angle. There are no angles in the four bar which appear like theta 1, phi 1, phi 2 and phi 3 in this elimination procedure. So after some simplification, you can see that this determinant of SM equals to zero gives you an equation which contains terms like 4a squared b squared l0 squared y squared or even terms like l1 squared minus a squared minus x squared minus y squared and the whole thing squared. So if you look at it a little carefully, you will see that this is a six degree curve in x comma y. Okay. So there are powers of you know which contains six degree terms okay in this equation okay so can you see one six degree term yes so for example if you look at this term so this has y square then the whole thing is squared here so that is to the power four and then it is multiplied by again by y square outside so there will be a term which is y to the power six okay so it's a six degree equation and this is the very well-known six-degree curve or equation for a coupler curve. Okay, this has been extensively studied in the kinematics of four-bond mechanism. Okay, so what have we done? What we have achieved is the following. We have taken the loop closure equation, okay, by breaking the coupler link at one point. Okay, then we have derived an expression of that point as the four bar mechanism moves and what is the relationship between x and y of that point okay so it's a one degree of freedom mechanism four bar so there must be a relationship between x and y because there can be only one independent variable and that equation is this coupler equation so given any x okay you choose an x and we can find out the y from this equation and we can plot that point okay as the four bar mechanism moves Okay, so what? So we have not used the traditional geometric or algebraic approach, which is used by uh, kinematicians. We have used the Sylvester's dialectic method before that group closure equations, and we have obtained the coupler curve. Okay, so this is the key step in kinematics of parallel robots. We have to find one equation which determines the degree of from the de actuated joint we can find the, the passive joints and completely describe the mechanism called the parallel robot we can also continue and we showed you that the elimination procedure gives delta as a function of xy and the link lengths we can also find out the joint angles so given since theta 1 is given we can find out phi 2 which is delta minus theta 1 and phi 2 is given by minus 2 tan inverse a1 c2 minus a2 c1 divided by this minus theta 1 okay so choose x find y then from that x and y find delta and then from that delta find theta 1 the angle phi 1 can be obtained from from the friedenstein equation Okay, this is a very nice equation because it directly relates theta and phi. Okay, remember we had broken it up at the two ends of the coupler and insisted that the position vector of the one end and the position vector of the other, the distance is L2 square. Okay, so we can find from the Friedenstein equation directly phi 1. Finally, we need to solve for phi 3, which is from the loop closure equation. Okay, we can solve for phi 3, which is theta 1 plus phi 2 minus phi 1 minus pi. Okay, so this is one way to solve the parallel kinematics of a four bar mechanism. So we have started with the choice of one independent coordinates, in this case x, solve for y, then from that we solve for phi 2, theta 1 is given, and so on. We can also start from the Friedenstein equation. 
you could have solved for phi given theta 1 and then after some algebra you can show that you can solve for the other angles also okay let's look at an example so we have l0 which is 5 so the base link is chosen as 5, L1 is 1.0, L2 is 3.0, and L3 is 4.0, arbitrarily chosen, but chosen with the goal that the input link will rotate fully. So this is something called as a Grashof's criteria. It satisfies the Grashof's criteria. Okay, we'll derive this Grashof's criteria next class, okay, next, next lecture. But in kinematics of four bar mechanisms, there is this Grashof criteria which tells you that for certain sums of certain lengths, if it is less than or equal to sum of some other two lengths, then the crank or the input link will rotate fully. Okay, so this figure A shows a plot of phi 1 versus theta 1. Okay, this is from the Friedenstein equation. And there are two possible solutions, and both of these solutions are plotted. So one is this dotted, and one is this. Okay, and then from phi 1, we obtain phi 2 and phi 3, okay, by looking at those kinematic equations, and we can plot x and y. So, this is the other way of doing it. We have chosen, started with theta 1, solved phi 1, and then this. The analysis which I showed you, is first we first obtained the coupler curve and then went to the joint angles, but we could have done it the other way around also. We could have started with the actuated joint variables, solved for the passive joint variables, okay, and then obtain the x and y coupler curves. And in this case, the coupler curve looks like this. Okay, so there are two of these, one solid line which corresponds to this solution and one dotted line which corresponds to this solution. Let's take another example. Okay, so we looked at of planar case. Now we look at, as a, at a spatial case. So the first spatial case we will consider is a three degree of freedom parallel robot. So this is a three RPS parallel robot. So again, the three RPS means that there is a fixed base, there is a moving platform, and the corners of the base lie on a triangle, and then there is an R, P, and an S chain. Okay, so this is the third chain which is R, P, and S. So the actuated joint variable in this case is L3, okay, in this chain. Similarly, we can have an R, P, S. So this is actuated joint variable is L1. Okay, so there are three of them. So basically that is why there is a three R, P, S. So this is like a, some sort of a convention to denote that there are three serial chains connecting a base and a moving platform. So we can find the DH parameter for one of these RPS legs. Okay, so first joint alpha will be 0, 0, 0, and this angle theta 1, but actually the angle should be pi, uh, the DH parameter angle is phi 1, which is in this case not shown here, but that is same as pi by 2 minus theta 1. So you can go back and see the DH parameters we had derived in week 2 okay for some parallel robots and this is one of them the second link which is second row of this dh table alpha is minus pi by 2 a is 0 and this is l1 l1 is the <clears throat> translation along this prismatic joint okay and we stop at the origin of the spherical joint so the spherical joint angles do not appear in this dh table all these three legs are same in all of them, theta one, thetas are the passive joint variables and Ls are the actuated joint variables. Okay, so we want to do the analyze the kinematics of this 3RPS robot. So first we obtain the loop closure equations. Okay, how do we obtain the loop closure equations? We find the position vector of the three S joints from a fixed base from this origin. So what is the position vector of this point? We go by some distance along x and then we go along this length to this point. Okay, how do I find from here to here? We use the dh table. Okay, so how about second link? We have to go in this direction by some uh, distance along the base, along the fixed base and then along the leg. 
Okay, so we have chosen an X, Y, and a Z coordinate system in the fixed base with the origin O. So the first one is along this X direction itself. So I have taken this distance as B. Okay, so then this will be some B along the X component. And then the Y and Z. Likewise for the other one. The other one B is not along X and Y, but at some angle. So I have chosen these three points to lie on an equilateral triangle okay of this distance from the centroid as b and the angles are 120 degrees okay but it need not be so we could have chosen some other way of choosing the fixed base we can also choose the top moving platform also in this case as a equilateral triangle of some sides okay equal sides and the chosen point of interest is the centroid of this equilateral triangle so okay let's go get back so the position vector of the three S joints can be obtained as some B minus L1 cos theta 1, Y coordinate is 0, and L1, L1 sine theta 1. The second spherical joint is minus B by 2 because I said they are equilateral triangle. So the angles between the two uh, directions is 120 degrees. So minus B by 2, half L2 cos theta by 2. We will get now a y coordinate which is root 3 by 2 b minus this root 3 by 2 l2 cos theta 2 and l2 sine theta 2 and likewise the third spherical joint from the origin of the fixed coordinates is given by minus b by 2 half l3 cos theta 3 minus root 3 by 2 b into root 3 by 2 l3 cos theta 3 and l3 sine theta 3 okay so i can find the position vector in terms of the actuated variables which is l1 l2 l3 and the passive variables which is theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 which are the rotations of the rotary joints at the base so now we impose this ss pair constraint remember in one of the previous lectures we had said that if there are two s joints in a chain okay so the constraint which is two s s joints or SS pair impose is the distance between the centers of the two S joints are constant. So exactly the same thing. So the distance between S1 and S2 is given by this vectors difference base S1 minus base S2 and the square of this distance is assumed to be a constant K12 square. Okay, so now let's carefully look at this constraint equation. So what does this constraint equation con contain? So we have to look at this vector and this vector. So it must contain theta 1, it must contain L1, okay? it must contain theta 2, and it must contain L2. And that's all. Okay, The rest are all constant. B and root 3 and all these things are constant. So the first constraint equation contains L1, theta 1, L2, and theta 2. Likewise, the distance between spherical joint 2 and spherical joint 3 is again a constant. And this will contain L2, theta 2, L3, and theta 3. And the third constraint equation, which is the distance between spherical joint 3 and spherical joint 1, is again constant. So we are assuming the constants are k12 square, k23 square, and k31 square. Okay, and the third constraint equation should contain L3, theta3, L1, and theta1. So notice the first equation does not contain L3 and theta3. The second constraint equation does not contain theta1 and L1. And the third constraint equation does not contain L2 and theta2. Okay, this is the important piece of observation. Okay, the S joint variables also do not appear of the SS pair equation. This we have seen earlier. So these three equations are in three passive joint variables. Okay, so what are the passive joints variables? Theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. So L1, L2, and L3 are given to you. They are the actuated joint variables. So in the direct kinematics problem, the actuated joint variables and the geometry is given. So this is the simplest possible loop closure constraint equations for this mechanism. So we have the minimal set of equations, which is three, and there are three passive joint variables. So this is sort of hard to do an analytically elimination. We have to assume some numbers. So we will assume that B is one. It is not a very 
you know, serious assumption. So everything is scaled by the size of the base platform. And K12, K23, K31 is root 3A. So basically we are assuming that the top platform is also an equilateral triangle of side A. So we eliminate using Sylvester's dialectic method, theta one from first and the third constraint equation. Okay, so you can see So the first constraint equation contains L1, theta1, L2, theta2. And the third constraint equation contains L3, theta3, L1, and theta1. So we can eliminate theta1, which is the passive joint variables from the first and third constraint equation. What will we be left with? We will be left with L1, L2, theta2, L, L3, and theta3. So that's what is mentioned here. So we use Sylvester's dialectic method to eliminate theta one from the first and the third constraint equation. And we will be generating a constraint equation or an equation which contains L1, L2, L3, theta two and theta three. This will be of this form. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of how each of them are obtained. They are obtained using a symbolic manipulation software called Vapor and we will have a1 c2 minus a2 c1 square and so on this is equal to zero where c1 c2 a1 a2 b1 b2 are now functions of only l1 l2 l3 and theta2 and theta3 okay theta1 is no longer there next we eliminate theta2 from this fourth equation and the second equation. Recall the second equation contained theta two, did not contain theta one. Second equation contained theta two and theta three. Okay, so we can eliminate theta two from this fourth equation which we have derived and the second constraint equation and then substitute x3 as tan theta three by two and then do a lot of simplification and you will be ending up with a eighth, actually a 16th degree polynomial, but it is an eighth degree polynomial in X3 square. Okay, so recall X3 is tan theta three by two. So we'll have Q8 X3 square to the power eight, Q7 X3 square to the power seven and so on. Okay, so what what is this equation? This equation contains only L1, L2, L3 and the geometry A and B and so on. Okay, it does not contain any other passive joint variables. So this is the equation which we are looking for. And we have obtained this using the Sylvester's dialectic method in two steps. So first eliminated theta one, then we eliminated theta two, and we obtained a single equation in theta three or tan theta three by two. And this is a eighth degree polynomial in X three square, okay. So these expressions for these coefficients are very, very big. Okay, it, this was obtained using the symbolic algebra software called Maple, as I told you. So two small ones, so which is this Q8, which is the leading term, which is Q8 into X3 squared to the power eight is given by this long expression. Q0 is also given by this horribly long expression. Where R0, P0 and etc. are again given by complicated expressions. But the only important thing to realize is we can find all the coefficients Q0, Q1, all the way to Q8. And all these coefficients are only functions of constants or L1, L2, L3. Okay. So for example, you can see that this R0 here okay, is constant. Whereas R1 here, which is R1 a cube, is 12 into L3 minus 3. Okay, so we can find these expressions. And this is done mechanically using this symbolic algebra software called Maple. So what is the end result? So given values of L1, L2, L3, we can find eight possible values of theta 3. Okay, and once 
theta 3 is obtained, theta 2 can be obtained from the second constraint equation and theta 1 can be obtained from the third constraint equation. Okay, so this is the direct kinematics of the three RPS. So given the actuated joint variables L1, L2, L3, we first obtain theta 3, then we obtain theta 1, and then we obtain, sorry, then we obtain theta 2, and then we obtain theta 1. Okay, three passive joint variables. The problem is not yet finished. We need to find the position and orientation of the output link or the end effector. So in this case, the natural output link is the moving platform, the top moving platform. The position and orientation of the top moving platform, we can assume that the position is the centroid of the top moving platform, which is nothing but the sum of the vectors connecting the three points of, on the top platform. So basically, if I know the location of the three spherical joints, the centroid of the top platform is given by one third of this vector base 2 s1, base 2 s2, and base 2 s3. Okay, if we don't choose the centroid, then we don't have one third. We'll have some ratios, okay, of the three vectors. And the orientation of the top moving platform can also be obtained. So what is the orientation? So we say that the x vector, the x axis of the rotation matrix, top to the base, is along S1 to S2, is the vector unit vector from S1 point to S2 point, from the first spherical joint to the second spherical joint. So this is the unit vector. The between S1 and S3 is not necessarily perpendicular to between S1 and S2, but we can find the cross product of this vector S1 to S2 and S1 to S3, okay, and find the unit vector along this, and the cross product will be normal to that moving platform. Okay, so this is the z-axis, and the y-axis is the product of z cross x. Okay, again, right-handed coordinate system. So we can define the orientation of the top platform by x vector between first and second spherical joint, the z-axis normal to that plane, okay, and the y-axis, which is normal to both z and x. Okay, think about it, it is quite natural. So we have chosen the output link, which is the top platform. And in particular, we have said that I want, I'm interested in the motion of the centroid and the orientation of the top platform. Okay, so once L and thetas, the actuated and the passive joint variables are known, we can substitute all those things in these expressions here, and we can find this vector P, which is the location of the centroid of the top platform, and the rotation matrix of the top platform with respect to the fixed base. Okay. So the key step was the elimination of the passive variables and obtaining a single equation in one passive variable, in this case, theta 3. Okay. And this is where the Sylvester's method or the general theory of elimination has been used. Okay. So what let's look at a numerical example. The polynomial in equation 15 is eighth degree in tan theta 3 by 2 square. Okay, so we cannot solve eighth degree polynomials in closed form. So we go to MATLAB and we use some program okay standard matlab tools like f solve to solve for that numerically and to solve for that numerically we have to assume some values of a and l1 l2 l3 so we have chosen a as half l1 as 2 by 3 l2 as 3 by 5 l3 by 3 by 4 we could choose any other values of that a and that l1 l2 l3 okay remember b is 1 the fixed base is scaled so all the dimensions uh, are in the B is related to one fixed space. So we get two sets of values of theta three because, okay, so we'll get plus minus 0 0.811 radians, plus minus 0 0.8028 radians, okay? And for the positive values of theta three, theta two is this and theta one is this, okay? So for the set 
0 0.4701, 0 0.4809 theta 2, and 0 0.811, which is theta 3 here. Okay, the origin of the centroid of the top platform is located x coordinate is 0 0.0. 117 y coordinate is minus 0 0.0044 and the z coordinate is 0 0.4248 and the rotation matrix can be also obtained by solving for the x axis then the normal to the plane and the y axis okay so let's continue and look at another example which is the six degree of freedom example so this, as I have mentioned earlier, it models a three-fingered hand gripping an object. So these are the three fingers, B1, uh, which is fixed base B1, then L11, L12, L13. These are the finger uh, elements or the link lengths in the finger. And likewise, we have another finger and we have another finger, third finger. Okay, the distance between these two fingers is 2D and this distance is H. So these are constant. Okay, and it is gripping an object with point contact with friction. So that can be modeled as a spherical joint. Okay, so how do we start? We first obtain the DH parameters for each one of these fingers. Okay, so the finger is R, 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 and S chain. So previously we had R, P, S. In the 3 RPS example here, each chain is R, 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 and S. Okay, so we can find the DH table, which is first link 0, 0, 0, theta 1. Second link is pi by 2 because the second rotation axis is perpendicular to the first rotation axis. So pi by 2, this is L11. The distance is uh, DI is 0, and this angle is psi 1. And the third link is parallel to the second. So third joint is parallel to the second joint. So we have alpha as 0, ai as l12, and 0, and this is phi1. Okay. So as usual with all dh convention, l13 does not appear. But when we find this position vector, when we assign a tool coordinate system, l13 will appear. So what is the basic idea? We will fix one coordinate system fi at the base of each of these fingers. So this is F1, this is F2, and this is F3. Okay. We know this is a six degree of freedom robot. Okay. So when you grip the object, you can manipulate the gripped object. You can change the X, Y, Z, and you can also orient the object. So you can think of you are holding a small ball, and we will look at these things later Okay, in more detail. And you can see that you can change the orientation of the ball. And we can also move the center of the ball in some sense. So out of these three, theta 1, psi 1, phi 1 in this first finger, then theta 2, phi 2, psi 2, psi 2, phi 2 in the second finger, and likewise in the third finger. So if it is 6 degree of freedom, only 6 out of these 12, okay, so not, sorry, six out of the nine. So this is not 12, this should be nine. Okay, so six out of this nine joint angles are actuated. Okay, it's a six degree of freedom system. So there can be only six actuated joints. Okay, so in this example, we will assume that the first two joints are actuated. So theta one and psi one is actuated and phi one is passive. Likewise, theta 2 and psi 2 are actuated and phi 2 is passive and so on. Okay. So what is the task? We need to find loop closure constraint equations to solve for the three passive joint variables. Okay. So how do we go about? We can find that the position vector of the spherical joint P1 with respect to the fixed coordinate system at the base of the finger can be written in terms of this L i1, l11, l12, and theta1, psi1, phi1. Okay, so this is obtained by finding the dh table, finding the transformation matrices. You multiply three transformation matrices and then pick the last column, which is a position vector with respect to a 
coordinate system which is fixed at the base of the finger. So with respect to another base which is somewhere in between, you know, like the hand or the palm which is fixed to the palm, okay. let's denote that coordinate system by base. We can show that this first joint is located at my 0 minus dh, second joint is 0 dh, and the third joint is 0, 0, 0. Okay. The orientation of Fi with respect to this base coordinate system is also known. Okay, so we have chosen the base coordinate system, which is sort of the midpoint or some point connecting the three finger base points. Okay. And it turns out to actually model a three fingered hand, the F3 coordinate system must be rotated by an angle gamma about the Y axis. Okay, you can look at your uh, three finger okay the thumb the index and the middle finger the thumb initially starts off at a different angle so we can find the transformation matrices base to the spherical joints okay four by four homogeneous transformation matrix by going from base to f1 then 0 to 1 1 to 2 2 to 3 and then 3 to p1 so 3 to P1 will contain the last L13 or L23 and L33. Okay, the last transformation includes the last link length L13. So we multiply all this for uh, this. How many are there? So 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 transformation matrices. And then we extract the position vector of the last link. Okay, last transformation matrix, the resultant transformation matrix. So this will give the position vector of the spherical joint one with respect to the base. Okay, so this is given by base to P1 and be written in more detail. Base to B1, which is the position vector of the base of the finger and then F1 to P1. And it turns out that these are not very complicated, but reasonably complicated expressions containing theta 1, psi 1, and phi 1, and the link lengths L11, L12, L13, and so on, and this distance D and H. Similarly, for the second leg, we can find base P2. This will contain theta 2, psi 2, phi 2, and this again this D and H, and the link lengths in the second finger. And the third one, but third one, as I said, we need to pre-multiply by a rotation matrix gamma because the base thumb finger starts at a different angle. Okay, so the basic idea is we have now the position vectors of the three contact points modeled as spherical joints. Again, we use the SS pair constraint. So between the first contact point and the second contact point, these are modeled as an SS pair. So the distance between those, that must be constant. So between P1 and P2, okay, the distance is K1 squared. It's very similar to what we did for the 3RPS case. So this equation will contain theta 1, psi 1, phi 1, theta 2, psi 2, and phi 2. The second constraint equation is between point 2, a fixed you know, spherical joint 2, and the spherical joint 3 and that is given by k23 square and the third one is between 3 and 1 and this is k31 square so where these distances k12 k23 and k31 are constants so we have three equations in three passive joint variables okay so as i have said we will assume that the first two joints are actuated and the third one is passive okay so the passive joints are phi1 phi2 phi3 and the actuated joints are this theta 1, psi 1, theta 2, psi 2, theta 3, psi 3. Okay, the first two joints in each finger. So again, we can use this Sylvester's dialectic method to eliminate phi 1 from the first and third equation. And we get an equation which contains phi 2 and phi 3 and all the actuated joint variables. Then we can eliminate phi 2 from this equation and the second equation, and we get a single equation in phi 3. Okay. 
So this is again a two step process. We eliminate one from two equation and then we eliminate the other one from the resultant equation and one of the original equation. Okay. So this turns out to be a 16th degree polynomial in tan phi 3 by 2. Okay. Again, we have obtained this equation using symbolic algebra software maple. You know, coefficients are very, very long, as you can see. So the main difference between this example and the previous 3RPS example was there were three actuated joints and three passive joints, okay, which we needed to find out. In this case, there are six actuated joints and three passive joints, and we obtained a 16th degree polynomial. In the previous case, it was actually 8th degree polynomial in x3 square. So let's do a numerical example. We assume d1 is d is half, h is root 3 by 2, and the actuated joint variables are arbitrarily chosen as 1 half, 1 fourth, and so on. And then this distance between spherical joints are assumed to be equal, root 3 by 2. So for the chosen actuated joint variables, theta 1, psi 1, theta 2, and psi 2, which is 0 0.1, all in radians, okay? We can find that the 16th degree polynomial is obtained in this horribly complicated form. Okay. Nevertheless, we can find it. Okay. It takes a while. It takes a lot of simplification and computation, but we can show that there is a t3 to the power 16. t3 is tan 5, 3 by 2. The coefficient is 0 0.00012. So, for example, t3 to the power 6 is 0 0.18502, okay? Only the first five places of decimal are shown here. We can solve numerically this equation in MATLAB, okay? And we'll get two real values of phi 3, so 0 0.8831 radians and 1.8239 radians. So there is a root solver in MATLAB, which given a polynomial, it will give you all the roots. And it turns out, in this case, there are two real roots only. And once we have found out phi 3, we can find out phi 1 and phi 2 from the previous two equations, okay, from the generated equation and one of the original equation. And phi 1 and phi 2 are given by 0 0.3679, 0 0.1146. And likewise, phi 2 is 1.45 and so on. Okay, so this is a numerical, uh, basically numerical. You just give the equations to MATLAB, give the known values, and it will tell you all the unknown values. It will solve those equations. So as we see in the direct kinematics, we now need to find the position and orientation of the moving platform, which is the chosen output link. So again, we will assume that the base to P, which is the centroid of the top platform, is given by one third of these vectors, sum of one third, one third base P1, one third base P2, and so on. And we'll get an X, Y, Z coordinate of this form. So X is 1.37, so on, Y is 0 0.26, so on, and Z is 0 0.1401. We can also find the rotation matrix of the gripped object, okay, and this is object to base R, and again we showed, we choose the x-axis between first and second joint, z-axis is normal to that plane formed by those three points, and y-axis is perpendicular to z and x, and we can find this rotation matrix. So, in this lecture, we have discussed how to obtain the direct kinematics of parallel robots. Okay, so the key ideas were that we need to derive the loop closure constraint equations. From the loop closure constraint equation, we find the passive joint variables. And then knowing the active and passive joint variables, we obtain the position and orientation of the chosen output link. In the next lecture, we'll look at mobility of parallel manipulators.